All right, so we are ready when you are, Wes. We have three people. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Five. Okay. Well, good, good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon. I'm Wes Klein, agriculture agent for uh, records in, in, in Cumberland County. Before I start talking about uh, FISMA and the USDA harmonized audit, I want to mention about COVID and where we are with vaccination for farm workers. There will be a survey <clears throat> coming out hopefully this afternoon, that will go to uh, farm owners to fill out and it'll be an electronic survey, which then gets, after you fill it out, you send it back and it goes to the Department of Health, New Jersey Department of Health. They will then contact the local, either local county health department or the uh, federally qualified health centers. For instance, Cumberland County is complete care, but there are different ones around the state. Then the, the either the health department or the FQHC will contact farms at, to set up times for vaccinations. If you have a, a large population, they will probably arrange to come to your location. If you just have a, a few workers, they'll have centralized centralized locations where you can uh, come and get your vaccination. So hopefully starting next week, there will be some uh, vaccinations given. It will be the J&J, &J, the Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccination. So that will uh, help with uh, logistics so you don't have to go a second time. The type of information they're asking for on the survey, and I have not seen the survey, but what I've been told, they will ask for obviously your name, your location, how many people would need to be vaccinated, uh, and whether it's gonna be one time, or if you have like, for instance, two groups of workers coming, would it be two different times? So that's, I was told that the survey is about, it takes about five minutes to do. Uh, but this is going to be the main contact for how you would arrange your vaccinations. If for some reason you would rather go direct, I would suggest you try to contact the, the federal, federal Qualified Health Center in your area and talk to them direct about uh, scheduling an appointment. Is there any questions? Anyone can unmute themselves and ask questions as we go through this presentation, because I really wanted to make it as interactive as possible. So you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, we're about, I'm going to start talking about, uh, again, FISMA and the USDA harmonized audits. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the audits and audits in general. But I think the place where you really need to start, well, for one thing, this is our website. The bottom half of this uh, picture is our website. Information you want related to COVID, related to third-party audits, related to resources for developing, for instance, uh, logs or other questions you have related to audits, you can find the information on our website. We also have what the water testing uh, sites are or, or labs in New Jersey and what they test for. So this is a good site for good information about uh, food safety in general. And that's the top one up there, onfarmfoodsafety.rutgers.edu. The New Jersey Department of Ag just uh, launched their food safety website. And you can see that's the next one down there. And they have general information about food safety. Also, on the lower right, when you go on that website, you will see uh, a place for a survey. And that survey, if you fill it out and send it in, will give them the information to do an on-farm readiness review. For anyone who has gone through the Produce Safety Alliance training, which is the training that's recognized by the Food and Drug Administration, we will do an on-farm readiness review for you. This is a confidential and free service. 
Uh, it's funded through our grants. And what it is, is one person from the Department of Ag, New Jersey Department of Ag, and an extension person comes out, does a walkthrough of your operation, and gives you suggestions of changes you may need to make before there's an official inspection. So that service is available to you. We wanna do that when you're in production. So we get a good idea of how things function. So why do we have both audits and inspections? Before 1998, there were several foodborne illness outbreaks in the US and it really spurred what was going to happen uh, from 1998 forward. In, 26, in, in 1996, 97, about 2,400 individuals were sick from some cyclospora from raspberries. In March of 97, there were students and teachers uh, contracted hepatitis A from frozen strawberries. And because of that, and also the Food and Drug Administration concerns about food safety, I can remember them discussing this in the late 80s that people need to pay more attention to for foodborne illnesses, but really it was not on very many people's radar, including the, the, including the government organizations. But FDA released the guidance to minimize microbial food safety hazards for fresh fruits and vegetables in 1998. And this was really the basis for all third-party audits that were developed in the, in the US after that. Then in 2002, uh, USDA released their Good Agricultural Practices Audit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on and, and the New Jersey's role in that. 2003, 2003 there was a hepatitis outbreak uh, in Green Onions. And this was the, the Chi Chi's restaurant in Western Pennsylvania. 600 people were sick, three people died. And this is one of the reasons you do not, no longer see Chi Chi's restaurants in the United States. At the same time, there was an outbreak in October of that year uh, related to spinach, where two people died and 16 people were sick. In November of the same year, 640 people were uh, contracted hepatitis A and three people died. So it was ongoing outbreaks uh, related to food safety. But in 2006, it was the year of hell for, for food safety. It was the year of the big spinach outbreak on the, from the West Coast. It was E. coli 015787. Over 300 people became ill and four people died, including a baby. And many of those people who were sick are, have ongoing problems because of kidney failure and are on dialysis. So this is the one that really enforced the industry to say, we need to have government involvement in food safety. Prior to this, the, the larger growers, California, Florida, uh, Arizona growers kept saying, we can handle this. We can do what needs to be done for food safety. But in 06, this really pushed it over the edge. Then in 08, we had another outbreak related to tomatoes and peppers. 1,400 people got ill, 286 hospitalized. Luckily, no one died. And then 2011, Jensen Farms. And this is another key point where it really has pushed food safety. Uh, this was melons and it was listeria. A uh, couple reasons. It could have, been, it could have been from the water on the floor in the packing house. It could have been some retrofitted equipment. It could have been a water issue, but 147 people became ill, 33 died. And this again was another thing that really pushed food safety. As I said, prior to 2006, the industry was really trying to do things on their own. This is just one of the example of the documents they created. And there was another one on herbs, one on green onions, one on melons, uh, some on tree fruits. And there were a lot of these things that were developed, but again, all based on that 1998 document from FDA. But this was the 2006 that I mentioned before. We started out with that spinach outbreak in September. 
We then had a botulism issue of carrot juice in September. We had a salmonella issue with tomatoes in November. We had a curly spinach in Texas issue in December. And we had Taco Bell and Taco John's in December. So this was one of the worst years for food safety in a long time. You did see things like this, uh, trying to make a somewhat of a joke about the spinach and the quote from Willie Nelson, it's good, to, good thing I had a bag of marijuana instead of a bag of spinach or I'd be dead by now. But in reality, this is what, this is what happened. Uh, again, 146 people in the end got sick, 30 people died, one miscarriage, and many of these individuals are all now on dialysis. So what have we been doing in New Jersey? And this sort of is a step back. This is a letter, part of a letter that growers received in March of 1999 after uh, FDA released their, their do guidance document. And in part, it said, we will not purchase leafy greens from Southern New Jersey unless a food safety program is in place. Once the produce program is in place, we will purchase produce only from growers, shippers, meeting the objective standards necessary to be certified under the program. This came from a major supermarket in the US. In early 1999, no one had a certification program in place. No one was even hardly thinking about developing a certification and program in place. Luckily, there was enough pressure from the industry, both other supermarkets and large growers, that this supermarket chain backed off. But this just gave an indication of where, where we were headed in the future and we needed to do something. So the New Jersey Department of Agriculture agreed to set up a third party food safety audit program to certify growers and shippers in New Jersey. Uh, and part of the reason was the companies that were coming in and offering services were very, very expensive. And the, the New Jersey industry felt this would be a cheaper way to do it. So the collaboration between New Jersey Department of Ag and Cooperative Extension, we developed a third party audit checklist that was ready for the 2000 growing season. At the same time, uh, the New Jersey Department of Ag Secretary and the California Secretary of Food and Agriculture solicited USDA to develop a national third party audit program that would be standard, standardized across the US. So what the USDA did, they took our checklist that we had developed and used that as part of their plan to develop a third party audit system. And in 2002, they released their good agricultural practices, good handling practice audit. And this is what was used up until the harmonized audit was developed. In reality, there were very few takers of this. The industry stopped pushing for something. So the amount of effort was put into it turned out to be a lot of effort with very little response from growers at that point. <clears throat> In 2009, what was happening between 2002 and 2008, there were a lot of audit firms coming out there. There was a lot of push uh, to have growers get audits, especially on the larger growers and it was starting to trickle down to, to uh, smaller growers in the East. Also, each audit firm had a different type of audit. And we had some growers in situations where we had to get four and five different audits, just because this one was a little bit different than that one. When United Fresh Produce Association looked at many of those audits and compared them together, it came out that about 90 to 95% of the information was exactly the same, but the questions may have been worded a little bit different, or the point structure may have been a little bit different. And this was causing a lot of uh, worry and cost to growers. So United Fresh brought a group together, most of the audit companies with one big exception, 
to develop a audit that would be harmonized and would be acceptable to all uh, buyers. That was the goal. We've never reached that goal, but that was the goal. And this is an ongoing process, by the way. So the harmonized audits were available in 2011 and 2012. And that's what I'm going to compare the inspections against. Talk a little bit about FISMA. Uh, FISMA was signed into law in 2011. It was the biggest change to fresh fruits and vegetables as far as the Food and Drug Administration was concerned, essentially since the inception of FDA. It became effective or started to become effective in 2016 uh, and it was phased in 2016, 17 and 18. It is now in effect to, for the industry. And I'll talk about where the exceptions are because there are some exceptions. But the whole rule is really based on prevention. There are seven main parts to the rule. And we're gonna concentrate on the produce safety rule because that's the main one that affects most of our growers. But there is a preventive controls of, of human food that's uh, good manufacturing. It only applies to growers in the sense that they have a centralized packing system where they're buying in product, for instance, to pack. That's where that would apply to, to growers. And in New Jersey, there's very few situations where that would be the effect. Preventive controls of animal food. That is where it's all pet foods, all uh, a cattle food feed, for instance, horse feed including down to the point of someone who's making dog treats and selling them at a uh, farmer's market. Foreign supplier verification programs, that is putting on the onus on the importers that the people they're purchasing product from offshore are meeting the same standards as the US. And the accreditation of third party auditors and certification bodies is the group that FDA doesn't have the personnel or the funds to be auditing all or inspecting all operations offshore. So they're accrediting third party auditors and, and certification bodies to do that as a service. Sanitary transportation of human and animal foods. That's fairly clear. It's anyone transporting any type of food, whether it's animal or human, then there are certain things they have to do and prevention of intentional contamination and adulteration. And I think that's fairly clear. All of these are now in effect and they all have different training components to them. So switching back to audits again, there are two main standards uh, that are used for auditing in the US. One is the harmonized standard, which is owned by United Fresh. And the other one is GFSI, which is the Global Food Safety Initiative. And this is European based, but most of the large retailers in the US uh, are requiring some type of GFSI certification. Audit firms, there are many. This is only a few of them. Uh, as I said, USDA has three main audits, the GAP, the Harmonized, the Harmonized Plus, and the Harmonized Plus is GFSI benchmarked. So it is comparable to GFSI and recognized that way. Then you have many other audit firms such as Global Gap. They, they will audit uh, the standard, the harmonized standard. They, harm, they, they will audit uh, GFSI. They have several different audits. All of these firms have several different audits depending on your size of operation and what you want audited. And again, this is not all the ones that exist. Most growers in New Jersey are either doing USDA audits or Primus GFS audits. There are a few that are doing SQF and a few are doing BRC, British Retail Consortium, but that number has gotten less and less. Now let's get into comparing the, the produce safety rule to third party audits. And again, it's mainly gonna be the USDA audits, but I will point out other things. Uh, under the produce safety rule is federal law, thus it's a mandatory inspection. For third party audits, they're voluntary. And I'll go into details about these as we go along. Uh, the federal law is for all uh, fresh produce operations in the US. And on a 
on a third party audit, it, depending what your buyer requires. Uh, all covered uh, under the, the produce safety rule, it covers all covered produce. Covered produce is things that are normally eaten fresh. So it's fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, with an audit, it could be one commodity. You may grow 10 different commodities, but your buyer wants your tomatoes. So requiring an audit just for those tomatoes. For the produce rule, it's the entire farm. And as I said, for third party audit, it, it depends, it could be commodity. Uh, FDA considers the, the produce safety rule as a minimum standards for food safety. So they would like to see everyone getting up to that level. Third party audits, no, there's no doubt they're higher standards. There's many more records. And I'll go into that in a minute. Again, if anyone has any questions, just please raise your hand or un unmute yourself and ask. So the difference between inspection and audits, as I already said, they're mandatory for inspection, they're voluntary, and you're meeting some type of a standard, whether it's the uh, harmonized standard, whether it's SQF standard, depending what it is. Uh, under the inspection, you must have a training that's recognized by, by FDA, and we provide that training. In fact, we had a two-day training this week, and our next one is in September. With audits, you must have some type of food safety training, but that's up to you and, and the, the group that you're being audited by. Again, under, the, the, under FISMA, the inspection of all covered crops and activities on the farm. Uh, and under the inspection, there's no written plan required. An inspector come out and ask you what you do for certain things in food safety. For instance, uh, when, are, when are workers required to wash their hands, for instance? Under an audit, you must have a written plan. No audit firm will audit an operation without a written food safety plan. And depending on what the audit firm is, some are very, very specific about written records and that's where they spend all their time. Others spend more time in the field. On their inspection, their prearranged visits, Generally, uh, the, the grower gets a call five days before they're going to do the inspection and they arrange a time and place to meet. Again, with audits, they're also prearranged visits. Under the inspection, the way it's structured right now, the first inspection is educational inspection. And then there will be another inspection about every four years. That varies from state to state. In New Jersey, this is about what they're talking about. With audits, they're always annual inspections. So you have to do it annually to maintain your certification. The inspections are free and they're being covered under uh, the FDA's uh, food safety uh, agree or, uh, rules. With audits, the, U the USDA audit right now is $115 per hour. And it works out to be about $1,300 for a, a harmonized audit. And the amount of time that uh, someone is, is on the farm, it really depends with a harmonized audit. The audit takes about six to eight hours, depending on the size of operation. And for an inspection right now, it's taking about three hours. So it gives you some idea of how long it would take. They also, under, with the audit, the USDA audit, they will ask you to send them documents they'll review before they come out and do the, the visual inspection. And part of that is because of COVID and trying to reduce the amount of time they're gonna be on a farm operation. With audits, the buyer may specify the audit firm that can be used. For instance, certain firms will only accept, for instance, Primus audits or Primus and global gap audits. Others will accept USDA Primus global gap. So the buyer specifies the audit firms that you can use. <laughs> under the inspection or under FISMA, there are exceptions. Uh, less than $25,000 in sales, uh, you're completely exempt from, from the FISMA rules. Also, and there's no ex ex exceptions under audits. It's 
because you're auditing specifically what the grower, what the buyer wants. It may, like as I said, it may be one crop. Under inspections, uh, there all are exceptions for commodities grown. And that's in section 112.2 of the, of the rule. And again, it's for fresh fruits and vegetables. So if you're doing processing, such as processing tomatoes, there's a kill step, then that falls outside the rule. And all you would have to show in that case is that the crop was processed. So a contract from the processor. There's also an uh, average annual food sales uh, to qualified end user, users as an exception. And what this means is $500,000 and less in sales of all food sales. And that can be your produce, milk, hay, animals, uh, jars of jelly, for instance, that would all get included. Also, it must be sold within 275 miles of where it's grown or in the same state. <clears throat> and 51% of your total production must be retail. By definition of the rule, retail is you selling it to a restaurant or you selling it to a supermarket, uh, a, a CSA, a, a farmer's market. As far as the restaurants and the supermarkets, for instance, if you sell, you have 50 boxes of lettuce and you sell 25 boxes of those, uh, that lettuce to a supermarket and the other 25 boxes you sell through a third party, such as a wholesaler, one is considered retail, one is considered wholesale. Exactly the same box, exactly the same variety, harvested the same day but that's where the definition is. As far as the paperwork that's required, there's minimum number of records un under, under the produce rule, there's eight total records that you would need. Of those, almost half of those are related to compost and, and manure use. So if you're not using manure, you're not using compost, your records is about four total records you would need. Under the USDA harmonized audit, there are 62 records. There are 50 either written procedures or plans, and there are nine assessments you need to do if you're doing all part, parts of the audit. And we'll talk a little bit about different parts of the audit in a minute. What about unannounced inspections? Uh, the only way that you would get an unannounced inspection under FISMA would be if the operation doesn't respond to the request for an inspection. Or if when they do one, there's a serious food safety question issue that needs to be handled. Or if there's a complaint recall or for food, food borne illness, excuse me, that could be uh, traced to that operation. Under uh, the harmonized audit, there is a possibility of unannounced audits and Right now, they are doing some unannounced audits. You would get a regular audit, and then sometime in the year, they, you would come back and do essentially a spot check, which would be the unannounced audit. <coughs> so these are the parts of things that fall under both uh, the rule and, and inspection under the audits. Uh, health and safety under the inspection, looking to see if you have enough footage on what your hand washing situation is. Uh, soil amendments, that's mainly soil amendments of biological, uh, biological activity. In other words, manure, compost, uh, table scraps would be included in there. Domesticated and wild animals, uh, what's the possibility of animal intrusion, for instance. Agricultural water, both pre and post harvest. Uh, pre harvest is what, what is your irrigation source? Uh, is it tested for generic E. coli, which is required under the rule? and what level it is, you're allowed to have some generic E. coli in the water, for instance, up to 126 colony forming units. And then also when you get into post-harvest, uh, this is washing equipment, sanitizing equipment. In this case, the water has non-detectable generic E. coli. So they'd be looking for your water tests. Post-harvest handling and sanitation, again, how are you cleaning your equipment? How are you sanitizing your equipment? These are the parts that fall under, under FISMA. Under an audit, uh, under the harmonized audit, there's 48 general questions. Uh, then once you do the general questions, the decision, you need to make the decision of whether you do field, 
or post-harvest or both. If you're doing field and, and harvesting, it's, it's 51 questions. Post-harvest operations, it's 64 questions. So you can see that it's a lot more involved when you get into an audit. If this was another company that was doing an audit, they may have more questions or they may take a question and divide it into several different parts. And the difference between the USDA harmonized and another company doing it partly is the cost. Uh, if you're having an outside firm do it, you're going to pay transportation. And some of those, trans those auditors may be from the West Coast. They may, may be from South America, they may be from Europe. So you're paying that, plus you're paying for the audit itself. It really comes down to what your buyer will accept. So when you look at the, the inspection and the, the audit, the inspection satisfies the obligation under FISMA and the, and the PSR, the produce safety rule. And that inspection, as I said, would be about every four years in this state. Buyers may accept that compliance with a PSR in lieu of an audit. And I can tell you right now, in this state, there is no buyers who will accept just the inspection for food safety. They will require a third party audit. FDA doesn't intend to issue certificates. The only thing you'll get related to inspection is a form, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the, so there will be no certificates. Uh, does not automatically protect a producer in case of a lawsuit. Uh, it does demonstrate compliance and may reduce civil or criminal liability but there's no guarantees. When you look at the audit, uh, passing it, uh, the audit indicates the farm is in compliance or at least in compliance that day. FDA suggested it may use uh, in consideration for prioritizing inspections and that actually is happening in this state. If you've been audit, audited for several years, generally you fall, fall further down on the list. The priority is, is it, for instance, a leafy green or a high risk crop, and leafy, all leafy greens are high risk crops. Then after that, have you been audited? So you drop down the list depending on, on what your crops are and whether you've been audited in the past. USDA does issue a certificate and places the information on their website once you pass the audit. If you do not pass an audit, they don't put anything on the website, they don't there's no indication whether you failed or not. Uh, it may reduce operations, civil liability in, in civil cases, but again, there's no guarantees. So what about non-compliance or failure? Under the inspection, there's a, a variety of uh, actions that are possible. One is re-education. The way FDA looks at this is you educate while and during regulations. They are not out to put someone out of business. Uh, immediate actions, corrective actions, if you can do something that day or shortly, it has a, that's a big factor, but there is a criminal enforcement possibility if it's an ongoing problem that cannot be handled. FDA, uh, reviews each of these case, on a case-by-case -case basis, and they're really trying to be very flexible on deciding what to do if there is a problem. We had a problem with an inspection, shall we say, in New Jersey, uh, and the inspector told the grower that FDA would be contacted. The FDA was contacted and the decision was made that there would be a reinspection by the inspector. The reinspection was held, and that was the end of the conversation. If it would have gone on longer, an FDA personnel would have gotten involved, then it would become more serious. And these are the administrative responsibilities. Corrective actions, as I mentioned, warning letters. FDA writes warning letters all the time for manufacturing, especially. And we get lists every week of the warning letters that have been written. There could be a halt, order to halt sales, and there could be criminal enforcement, including fines and incarceration. 
FDA has a, a situation right now in Pennsylvania, which been has been ongoing for a long time, related to milk, milk and, and raw milk, and people getting sick. And they have put a, a, a stop sale on that operation. And actually, they're in court now. What about an audit, if you don't pass an audit? There's no legal implications. This is voluntary. It's private. However, it may limit the number of buyers a grower would have because if a certain buyer wants to see an audit that you have passed and you don't have one, they may not buy from you. And that has happened. If a foodborne illness is traced to the farm, then are civil or criminal actions are possible, obviously. And this is the last one. If government, in this case, uh, New Jersey Department of Agriculture is conducting the audit, they're obligated by federal law to report serious health issues to FDA if they occur. So are there any questions up to this point? I'm gonna talk now about how you would get a, an inspection, how you would get an audit. Okay, no one's interested in talking, that's fine. So how do the inspections work? You would be contacted, contacted by New Jersey Department of Ag through Chris Klein Gunther's office. And Chris is in charge of audits and inspections for the Department of Ag. And that would be to schedule the appointment for the audit, which is again, as I said previously, five days prior to an inspection. The inspector would come out, meet with your food safety person, whether it's you or someone else, and do a walkthrough of the farm, plus review the required records. Okay, Lindsay, raise your hand. Hi there, thanks for the presentation. Um, I had a question uh, before we move on from the last section. Sure. Uh, uh, curious, years ago, I think it was back in 2013, um, we're a small certified organic operation, so this we won't qualify for a while, but um, we had gone through a gap training. Uh, I think it was held through Rutgers maybe, um, or cooperative extension. So I'm just wondering how long are these trainings valid for? Because that was now seven, eight years ago. So would we have to go through updated trainings? Yeah, seven or eight years ago, the training that we're doing now didn't even exist. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the first one was 2016, 2017. The, the, tra the training, the, the Produce Safety Alliance training, once you take it, it's good forever. Okay. So it's a one-time deal. It's in person. When we can do things in person, it's a full day training, six to seven hours. When we have to do them online, as we're doing now, it's two days, spread over two days. The same information, but spread over two days. Uh, the good thing about that training, whether you need to comply with FISMA or not, it gives you all the basics related to food safety. So, and it, that, uh, we post on our website when we're going to be doing those. And our next one again is September. Okay, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Uh, so once the, the inspector has gone through, did the walkthrough, review the documents, they have a form, which is, a, called 4056 and that form then would be sent to you after the inspection they would go back to the office fill out the form and it may have some suggestions on it remember that first inspection is educational so they're using that form to provide you with information they also may, uh, may provide you with contact information for instance they can't tell you how to correct a problem they can tell you it needs to be corrected so what they would say to contact either myself or Meredith, I, and we're really the two people who handle food safety in the state, along with, with, with Jen and Michael, uh, and help with training and also technical assistance. The difference with an audit is there is an audit standard, and the website is up there where you go to get that standard. It's on the USDA website. And Jen, maybe you can post that in the chat room. Uh, there, and make sure when you go to that website that you get the 2021 version. They have a new standard that's just been posted and it will go in effect May 1st. You need, 
need to develop your, your written food safety plan. You can ask for technical assistance if you need any. That's myself or Meredith. Then to, to schedule the actual audit, you go to the website, your email, I'm sorry, email the address I have on the, on the page here, and you'll receive back an agreement to sign, which the agreement essentially says, these are the parts I want audited, which for instance, harmonized, it would be the general question, do you have to have, then do you want the field or post-harvest or you want both, then, and the agreement to pay for the audit itself. Then you send that back and then they schedule the audit. They want to see you in production and they also need about 10 days worth of records. So they'll ask you to send some of those records to them so they can review prior to the audit. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact Chris. That's his cell phone number, the direct contact. And as I said before, once the audit is over, it is reviewed by USDA. You will not know that day of the audit whether you passed or not. You'll have a good indication just by the way the, the thing is going, but that it has to be reviewed by, by USDA in Washington. Once it's reviewed, then you'll get a certificate Plus, they will put that information on the website. And on their website, it'll have your name, your address, the date when you were audited, what you're audited for, what audit it was, and what crops it was audited for. So again, th this is our, our website. Uh, we do have more trainings coming up next Friday. We're going to be talking about backflow prevention in the packing house. And March 16th, we have a blueberry grower meeting. Uh, March 26th, uh, Meredith's gonna talk about on-farm record keeping for food safety. And then, in, as I said, in September, we have our, our Produce Safety Alliance training. And that's the website, the Eventbrite, where you can go and where you signed up for this, this training. Are there any questions? Anything at all about food safety? We have time. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, uh, for the for the talk. It's been very educating. Well, my small question, I was just trying to seek your permission to share an information about the survey that we are administering to growers and uh, buyers that you're aware of on our studies on uh, the adoption of uh, USC GAP standards. So I was wondering uh, if I can share the information through the chat box. Yeah, go ahead and post it in this chat box. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Jen, if there's no other questions, 